being here for our uh, Pellet Electoral Forum. Uh, this is the second event we've hosted during this election cycle. As all of you know, we had the uh, candidates for Wake County District Attorney uh, here last week uh, for a, a lively uh, discourse, and uh, we hope for the same today. Uh, we're going to do this in two segments. We're going to start with the uh, candidates for the Court of Appeals uh, in the races that involve less than a dozen people. Uh, <laughs> because I frankly could not figure out how to stage the other race, and I feel somewhat <laughs> guilty about that. But uh, I think everyone's having a little bit of a hard time figuring out how to deal with a 19-candidate race. Uh, but we do uh, have with us the folks who are contenders uh, for three of the seats uh, on the Court of Appeals. Uh, and uh, let me say at the outset that uh, Judge Bill Southern uh, has been calling me all day saying he is in court and finishing court and will be here as soon as he can get here, but uh, not, we waited until now in the hopes he would arrive, but uh, uh, he's not here yet. But uh, joining us, uh, we do have uh, Judge Mark Davis, uh, Judge Paul Holcomb, uh, Judge Lucy Inman, and Judge Donna Stroud. Judge, Judge Stroud, uh, I wanted her here. Uh, because she is running for a seat and she is a loyal Campbell graduate and professor. She has no opposition, so uh, uh, she has free reign tonight to say about anything that she wants. <laughs> so here's what we're going to plan to do. Uh, uh, I'm uh, going to uh, sequentially uh, go down the line asking a list of questions. I'll give everybody the same question. Uh, and uh, my first question, they've asked about an opening statement, will be in the nature of inviting you to make one. Uh, at the end, I'll give each of you a couple of minutes for any closing remarks that you want to make. Uh, and uh, then at 6, we will regroup, uh, maybe have a few minutes for some refreshments, and invite those candidates who are with us for the Supreme Court uh, to uh, further the discussion for tonight. So here goes. And we'll start with Judge Davis. Um, so what qualifications uh, do you bring to the office uh, of judge of the North Carolina Court of Appeals, Judge Davis? Well, first, Dean Letter, thank you very much for having us, and I appreciate everybody coming out. My name is Mark Davis. I currently sit on the Court of Appeals, where I've sat for the last almost two years. Um, by the time of the election next month, I will have decided over 600 cases and written approximately 200 written opinions, uh, majority opinions, uh, not including any concurrences or dissents. Before I went on the bench, I was a litigator for 17 years. I spent 13 as a member of the firm in the litigation section at Wamble, Carlisle, Sandridge, and Rice, where I litigated over 200 cases and handled over 45 appeals in the state and federal appellate court systems. I then worked for five years as an, a, de a special deputy attorney general at the attorney general's office. Uh, all of you know about the Court of Appeals. Uh, let me start by stating the obvious, the difference between appellate judges and trial judges. Trial judges, as we know, are primarily fact finders. Appellate judges are different. Our job is to decide whether or not the proper legal principles were applied to the particular case. At the Court of Appeals, we hear pretty much everything. Virtually every type of criminal case you can imagine except the death penalty. All types of civil cases, from the multi-million dollar contract toward property appeals to the appeals from small claims court, and everything and everything in between. We also hear appeals from workers' compensation, decisions from the Industrial Commission, we hear family law cases, and we hear appeals from various other commissions and boards throughout the state. I'm very proud in this campaign to have broad bipartisan support. I've been endorsed by 17 former justices and judges of North Carolina's appellate courts, including some who happen to be registered Republicans like Beverly Lake and Bob Orr, and some who happen to be registered Democrats like Burley Mitchell, um, Jim Exum, and Henry Fry. I've also been endorsed by, to my knowledge, all of the statewide attorney groups that have endorsed in our race, including the Association of Defense Attorneys, the North Carolina Advocates for Justice, and the Association of Women Attorneys. Uh, I love my job. I would very much like to keep my job, <laughs> and I'd be glad to answer any questions that Dean Leonard poses to us tonight. Thank you again. Judge Holcomb. <coughs> well, thank you. It is uh, wonderful to be with you here tonight. As I told some of you, this is... Uh, Campbell is the only law school that's actually invited us to come and speak with you, and so I appreciate those of you who have come out tonight. My name is Paul Holcomb. I serve as a district court judge for Johnston, Harnett, and Lee counties. And what that means to you is if you go to uh, see the Fighting Campbells the weekend after next, um, 
and uh, speed on your way down there and get pulled over by one of Harnett County's finest, then you may come and see me when I sit in Lillington. I uh, sit in Sanford, Lillington, and Smithfield uh, on a rotating basis. Uh, prior to that, I served as a prosecutor for uh, 14 years um, in more than one office here in North Carolina where I worked with law enforcement officers and community leaders to make sure that we had safe communities, safe schools, places where people wanted to live and grow. Um, I grew up here in Raleigh uh, before I uh, went to uh, undergraduate in law school. And uh, in 2008 is when I was elected as a district court judge. Now the reason that I'm running is because I believe it's very important that if you are on the Court of Appeals, whether you are appointed or elected, that you have experience as a trial judge. You're going to hear that not only I have experience as a trial judge, but uh, Judge Inman is here as a trial judge seeking a seat on the Court of Appeals. Bill Southern, when he arrives, is here as a trial judge seeking a seat on the Court of Appeals. And Donna Stroud was a trial judge before she uh, got her seat on the Court of Appeals. And that's important because, as uh, Judge Davis said, um, the Court of Appeals hears just about everything. Um, and if they're hearing a criminal case, it's very helpful and important that you've actually sentenced someone in a criminal case or that you've actually signed a, a, a search warrant or you've actually suppressed something, uh, which I have done all of those things. If you're hearing a domestic case and you're making a decision on the Court of Appeals, it's important that you have sat in a case like that and modified custody or set child support or issued a domestic violence protective order or uh, sat in a DSS case. So that's the primary reason that I am running, in addition to the fact that uh, actually on the Court of Appeals right now, there are very few individuals who have experience in those types of courts. Um, the Court of Appeals um, currently has uh, very few judges out of the 15 total um, that have sat in domestic court, DSS court, child support court, mental health court, or domestic violence court, and we need more judges uh, not only who have experience as judges, but who have sat in those courts in particular. I appreciate uh, you being here. My name is Paul Holcomb. Judge Jim. Thank you so much, Dean Leonard, for having us here and for all of you for taking time out of your busy days. I think the question was, what are the qualifications Patience. that I bring? And um, in a nutshell, 24 years of legal experience, uh, 53 years of life experience, <laughs> and a strong work ethic and a passion for justice. Um, I'm a superior court judge and have been on the bench for four and a half years. I'm a special superior court judge, which means that I was appointed by the governor. It also means that I, rather than serving six months in a, in a given district, I travel all across the state as needed from trial to trial and session to session. So I've held court in about 45 counties across our state. I, before I became a Superior Court judge, practiced civil litigation for 18 years. For eight years, I practiced commercial litigation in Los Angeles, and then for 10 years, I practiced here in Raleigh. I have seen, as a Superior Court judge and as a, as a litigator, the cultures all across our state, they're very different. I imagine that there are folks in this room who are from different counties across the state, and the cultures vary widely, uh, but the law must be the same everywhere. And as Judge Davis mentioned, the job of the appellate court is to make sure that all the trial courts are following the law as they should. Um, that is really important because the reason I'm running for the Court of Appeals is to make sure that everyone who walks into every courtroom in North Carolina in any of our 100 counties is treated fairly and with respect, regardless of your race, your gender, your faith, your political party affiliation, or anything else about you. I have the experience to gauge the different cultures and values across our state and the different risks there are to folks of injustices, and I am committed to making sure that, again, I'm following the law. Judges don't make the law. We follow the law, and that I am protecting the constitutional rights of every person who comes before the courts. I grew up in Raleigh, went to public schools went to North Carolina State University, undergrad, and got an English degree, worked as a newspaper reporter for a few years, and then went to law school, 
over in Chapel Hill. Um, I have uh, two teenage children and a most wonderful husband who has been the best single parent I know for the last year <laughs> during this campaign. Um, and again, my name is Lucy Inman, and I um, humbly ask for your vote and ask you to look for Lucy on the ballot as my race happens to be right after that 19 candidate race, and I don't want to be overlooked. Thank you. Judge Stroud, and I have to say when I asked Judge Stroud if she wanted to participate, given that she did not draw an opponent, her response was, well, 2022 is not that far away. Yeah. <laughs> so right. Judge Stroud. That's right. Uh, thank you very much for having me, even though I don't have an opponent. Um, I do like to have the opportunity to get out and, um, you know, talk to people and hear from people about the courts. Uh, we at the Court of Appeals, I mean, you know, it's a court that you don't hear a lot about necessarily. Um, you in law school probably hear more about it than most people. And, you know, no one wants to come see us, you know, as attorneys and parties. I mean, which I understand because when you come to see us, it means that you either lost a case and you're trying to reverse that or you won a case and someone is trying to undo that. So I understand why people don't want to come see us, but we do appreciate the chance to come and see you. Um, so just a, a little bit about my background. As you've heard, I went to Campbell, uh, actually undergraduate uh, and law school, and I'm an adjunct here. I teach judicial process, a little ad uh, for that uh, in the spring semester. Um, and Very uh, highly rated. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I, was, um, I was born and raised in Kinston, North Carolina. I decided in third grade I wanted to be a lawyer. I don't really know why. There was not a lawyer in my family. I had never met one. I did not watch one on TV that I know of. But somehow I got this idea and I never changed my mind. And by the time I was in high school, I had decided that not only did I want to be a lawyer, I wanted to go to Campbell. Because I had several friends in my church and whatever who'd gone to Campbell. And uh, so I went to Campbell. And of course, since my main goal was to go to Campbell Law School, I went ahead and did an undergraduate in three years, and got that out of the way so I could get on to uh, Campbell Law School. And uh, went there, absolutely um, loved it, uh, down in Bowie's Creek. And I, don't, you know, I think some of you might have seen that place that we used to uh, have the law school. And, um, you know, and, have just, and then went into uh, private practice when I got out of law school, practiced law for 16 years on a wide variety of things, and then became a district court judge in Wake County. And then since um, 2000, I was elected in 2006 to the Court of Appeals. And have been there ever since, and absolutely love it, and am just very ecstatic that um, I get to stay there for another uh, eight years and continue to do this. So, um, so I'm, but thank you very much for allowing me to come talk to you, and I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that I can. Judge so Holcomb, we'd like to get to know all of you a, a little bit better personally. Uh, can you describe a challenging case that you have struggled with and uh, how you went about reaching your decision? Well, um, I would say that the, the more difficult cases um, that we do as district court judges in particular are uh, DSS cases and domestic cases um, when custody of children is highly contested. Um, in fact, uh, just yesterday I was sitting as a uh, domestic judge um, hearing the case and um, it was a review of custody. Um, and halfway through, the Department of Social Services decided that they were going to get involved and that they wanted to file a petition. Now the law is that um, once a petition is filed, that moves the case over to DSS court and out of domestic court, and the domestic court is stayed until um, the, the juvenile judge is the only one that can decide to, to start the domestic case again. It, it gives domestic juvenile court uh, priority. Well, the complicating factor is I've actually been the DSS judge in Johnston County for the last 15 months. So um, when they came to me and informed me they were going to do this, I asked them to go and seek uh, custody of the children, physical custody, with another judge because I was certainly very concerned that if I granted that sitting as the domestic judge that there might be an issue. Um, when it essentially came to me in the next courtroom a week later on a hearing as to that. So um, just as Judge Inman said, it's very important, uh, having done this for six years, um, sitting as a judge, that, that everyone be treated fairly, uh, that they have impartial judges. And so I wanted to make sure that an impartial person who had not been listening to the evidence that I had heard uh, for the last day had a chance to decide whether those children needed to go immediately into the custody of the Department of Social Services. 
and also that way if I get the case as the uh, DSS judge, then they can feel like I hadn't already made the decision uh, that there was a problem and that the children needed to be removed from the parents. Judge Inman, a case of yours you'd, uh, that challenged you? Well, there have been so many, but um, um, I will, will say one case that, that challenged me in a, in a personal way rather than an intellectual way. I do all sorts of constitutional reviews and administrative law reviews, but uh, one of the cases that challenged me on a personal level was a probation violation case. And in, in North Carolina, if someone's placed on probation, their probation can be revoked under a couple of limited circumstances. And one is when someone absconds supervision. And basically that means when someone skips out, makes it so they're not being supervised anymore and their probation officer can't find them. It's a really important um, <laughs> rule that there has to be a serious punishment for somebody who absconds probation because if people don't respect that system, then we don't have the safety that we're assuring people when we say this person doesn't have to go <coughs> to, to jail, we're going to put him on probation. Um, I heard the case of a man who had been convicted of a felony drug charge, and I, it may have been a, a marijuana charge, um, but it was a felony, and he had been placed on probation. He had no criminal record, and about three months into his probation, he disappeared off the face of the earth. He's absconded probation, and he was missing for four years. Finally, I don't know what happened, if he got stopped um, in a traffic stop, but he was arrested and off comes back to my courtroom. Sounds pretty simple. And his sentence was four to six months, and it was already at the bottom of the range it could be. Well, it turns out that this man had had a child die and had kind of gone off the deep end, had lost his house, had lost everything, was evicted, and stopping going to see his probation officer was just one of the things that he stopped doing. And yet he had absconded his probation. And everyone sitting in that courtroom is looking, the probation officers, all of the defendants, and it's been my policy and just about every other Superior Court judge's policy, if you abscond your probation, I have to revoke it, and I have to send you to jail. Because um, we can't, he didn't have any documentation for what he was saying. I researched it. I asked his lawyer to, I told him I was going to revoke his probation, but I needed to figure out what the sentence would be. I asked his lawyer if he knew how we could get around this four to six month bracket. I asked other judges, I researched, I called the School of Government, um, and everywhere I went, I had no choice. Um, I, I revoked his probation, and I set his sentence at the minimum I could give him, which was four months. Um, I didn't feel good about it personally, but it was a principle was important to me that I follow the law and not make the law as I would like it to be. Um, I will say as an aside, there are judges who would say, why don't you just you know, send them to jail for a weekend? Who's going to complain? Nobody's going to complain. But I really felt like that's not, that's not my call. So that's the, the biggest challenge I've had. Judge Stroud? I think um, one of the, we, we get a lot of um, challenging cases, of course, at the Court of Appeals in a lot of different ways. Um, I think one of the most difficult things that we face sometimes is um, when we have um, case conflicting lines of authority, uh, either from our own court or from sometimes the Supreme Court, uh, such as one case that I had with there was a Supreme Court decision that had been consistently followed. The original one was back in the 40s or 50s. Several cases had followed it all through the years. And then there's a case much more recently, I think in the 90s, <laughs> Uh, that presents the same situation. The Supreme Court doesn't even mention the line of cases coming from the 50s forward and, and comes up with the opposite result. Um, and then, of course, I get the case in which I have to somehow distinguish these. Um, and, and I've had that happen a couple times where we have, you know, situations that, that seem, um, you know, but of course, as the Court of Appeals, since we have to follow all of it, 
uh, somehow, <coughs> even if it conflicts uh, sometimes. Uh, we have to find a way to distinguish that and try to make it work together. And so, you know, that sometimes takes a really long time. Uh, but. Judge Davis? You know, as Judge Stroud said, we get a lot of complicated issues in the Court of Appeals. Uh, they don't usually appeal the easy ones. By the time the parties have spent the time and money necessary to perfect the appeal and brief the appeal, it's probably going to be a complex issue. And they're not always very juicy issues. And the one I'm going to just briefly mention to you may sound strange because it is the opposite of juicy. I doubt anyone in the world would care about this <laughs> other than me and the parties who were before us on this. And Judge Stroud was on this panel. This was decided about three months ago in an opinion I issued. It had to do with whether or not an inter vivos transfer of deeds constituted a completed gift such that the decedent's estate would or would not be liable for the gift tax and the estate taxes for the property uh, subject to the deeds. I agonized over this case for months, kept it much longer than we're supposed to keep cases because, you know, as always, we really, really, really wanted to get it right. Uh, I wish I was, I don't miss much about private practice, but I wish I'd been getting paid for all the hours that I spent on that case. <laughs> <laughs> I would be a wealthy man. And after going through about 10 drafts of an opinion, uh, <clears throat> I was finally satisfied we got it right. Uh, the issue had to do with whether or not the trial court had given uh, appropriate jury instructions on the definition of completed gift and several other arcane uh, legal doctrines. And uh, so, I just mentioned that because it's truly one I agonized over, and to say all of you who've taken trust in estates, raise your hands if you have, please. It has real world application. You can make a lot of money representing people in trust in estates cases. <laughs> <laughs> Judge M, now that you have been involved extensively in an electoral campaign, uh, what is your view of election as a method of selecting appellate judges? Uh, would you retain it or would you advocate for other methods? Well, I first have to qualify any answer by saying, of course, I've sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution and follow the laws of our legislature. And our Constitution provides that judges are elected. Um, that said, and, and I have enjoyed a lot of the campaign process. I have really enjoyed meeting people all over the state. I think there's some poetic justice in judges who often are sitting and listening to attorneys who are all sweaty palmed wondering what to say. It's something poetically just about judges have to going out and humbly ask people for their votes. Um, I have been dismayed by the role of money and partisan politics in the election process. We've seen that already in our primary and um, I, I do believe that it bears exploring for the legislature and ultimately for the people of North Carolina to, to decide as voters whether or not we want to continue electing judges or have an appointment and retention system. Um, one time, um, most of the people in this room are too young to have been alive when this happened, Susie Sharp, one of the best chief justices on our Supreme Court, almost lost her seat to a fire extinguisher salesman, okay? Um, then we got the law that said you have to be a lawyer to be elected to be a judge. He was not a lawyer. He was not a lawyer. <laughs> and um, I, do, I do question whether the electorate is able to make an informed decision when so much um, money goes into advertising, especially outside money, and when people can't even remember the names of the candidates, much less know about their qualifications. Um, everybody in this room is to be commended for coming out and trying to find out about the candidates, but most people, most people don't. Um, so it's a mixed answer for you. Judge Stroud? Well, uh, of course, as Judge Inman said, you know, this is the law that we have, and so we will happily um, abide by it. Um, but, um, of course, as elections go, this particular one for me, um, it, being unopposed, I think, is, is a, the way to do it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, it's pretty unusual. Um, as best I can tell, and I've been, someone mentioned this to me, and I really wasn't sure, so I've been doing some research on it, trying to figure it out for sure. I think I'm the first woman to run for the Court of Appeals unopposed, and I think we've only had three total 
uh, run unopposed for the Court of Appeals, uh, you know, since it was created in 1967. Uh, so it's pretty unusual. Um, and uh, the, the thing with the judicial election and uh, judicial appointment, of course, the states vary tremendously in how they do it, but 30-some states have election as at least part of their process. And, um, you know, the, the pendulum tends to swing back and forth over history. Uh, Justice Hunter, who's going to talk to you later, wrote his thesis at Duke on that topic in North Carolina and how, um, you know, things have kind of gone from, of course, the judges were appointed and then people felt like, well, these appointed judges are too beholden to the governor and they won't hold laws to be unconstitutional and so now we're going to have elected judges and so we elect judges and then those judges were more willing to hold laws unconstitutional. And then the pendulum swings the other way and people say, well, the judges are too beholden to the people who give money and to the people who advertise and to the people who support them and so maybe we should, you know, do it back the other way and have them appointed. And of course, it just, it'll go back and forth uh, over time. So there's disadvantages and advantages to both systems. Uh, certainly one of the biggest advantages, um, as Judge Inman mentioned, is the fact that we get to come out and we get to talk to people. Uh, we certainly have the opportunities to go visit people and talk to people that we would have never gotten to do that before. I got to talk to the Cherokee Tribal Council when I was running last time. Uh, that was a lot of fun. I wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to do that uh, if I had not had to go out and, and do this process and many other groups that we get to talk to. So, so that part is a good thing, um, but obviously we all wish that all the voters were as informed as you are um, in the judicial elections and the polls of course consistently show that 90 some percent of the voters uh, don't know who the judicial candidates are. So that's the bad part of that. Judge Davis. Well, I was appointed to the court and I was curious the other day about how many uh, judges on the Court of Appeals had reached the job initially through appointment rather than election. And it's, uh, by my calculation, 88% of the judges on the Court of Appeals who've sat on our courts since 1967, like me, have been appointed. But of course, as we know, under our law, whether you, you, when you are appointed, you then have to run for election. Um, I really can't improve much on what Judge Stroud and Judge Inman said. I think there are pros and cons. By far, the best thing about it is it does get us out of the ivory tower, so to speak gets us to all corners of the state. We get to meet people we wouldn't otherwise meet. We get to see places we wouldn't otherwise see. And we get to really talk to people about the issues they're concerned with and about their interactions with the court. And I mean, I think we should just be striving, as all of us are, to have an informed electorate who can make informed decisions in judicial elections based on the qualifications of the candidates, as opposed to these outside ads that we're all familiar with that seem to care more about smearing people's character than they do about presenting an honest, objective portrait of their qualifications. Judge Hulk? Well, this is the question that, that we often get asked, um, as you might imagine. Um, I, I certainly feel very strongly that elections are appropriate. It's what gives you the opportunity to have a voice in who the judges are. And that's true both locally, who you're going to see if you get a traffic ticket on your way to law school, um, who you're going to see if you are a victim of a crime because someone broke into your apartment um, in the superior court level, um, and then who you got making decisions at the top level. And this is, this is the only way that you get that voice um, is if through elections. I've been elected. I've never been appointed um, in both 2008 and then ran unopposed in 2012 for my seat. Um, and I, personally, I enjoyed the opportunity and felt very differently about my election as a result of um, going out and actually looking people in the eye in 2008 across a three county area, um, including at Bowie's Creek, um, handing them a card and talking to them about why I wanted to be a district court judge and why the person who was appointed to that position, um, who I was running against, uh, did not need to be retained as a judge. So I, I certainly think that the electoral system is the best. Now, um, it does have some issues. Um, there are how many students enrolled at Campbell Law? 442, but who's counting? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you have 442 classmates. There are about 42 of you in this room. So um, even here, where you got a chance, to hear from everybody running on the Court of Appeals, you had about a 10% participation rate. And everybody else, uh, we can only hope, is going to watch this 
um, or read about it. As I understand, there's going to be an article. Um, and unfortunately, what is going on tonight at Campbell Law School is, re is reflective of what is going on in our society, that uh, the vast majority of people, um, 42 from, from 442, puts you at uh, about 90% who didn't show up. Uh, there was a poll in both of our races done two weeks ago, um, and it was determined that 85% of the people uh, in North Carolina did not know who they were going to vote for in the race that I'm in, and 83% did not know who they're going to vote for in uh, Judge Emmons' race. And this is after a year of campaigning, a year across the state of North Carolina. So there, there are issues that we need to try and address in terms of how we recruit candidates um, and how we can improve the process, but overall I certainly appreciate uh, elections. Judge Stroud, following up on a question uh, with comments you made about the Supreme Court, uh, the Court of Appeals itself has on occasion been criticized for issuing decisions that, if not contradictory, were sometimes uh, difficult to reconcile. And I'm, I must add, as a federal judge for a number of years, I found myself not infrequently in that quandary. Uh, is that a fair criticism? And if so, uh, what should the court do to try to minimize those instances? Well, it is fair, and it, it certainly happens. Uh, and it's something that we do, in fact, do our best to avoid. Uh, but, but here's the situation that we have. We have 15 judges on the court, so at any given moment we have five panels, three judges on each panel. We have about, at this point, what, 1,600, 1,700 cases a year coming through our court. Um, our staff counsel's office, when those cases come in, uh, as gets them prepared to send a panel of generally 12 cases, uh, you know, to a set of judges, and they try to screen for uh, issues, you know, if we've got the same issue, say, raised in more than one case. And so sometimes we are able to determine that we have an issue presented. Uh, and, you know, they can actually watch out for that and alert the court that, you know, another panel is looking at this same thing, uh, and we can try to coordinate and prevent that from happening. Uh, in, some, in some circumstances, there might even be the possibility for the Supreme Court to go ahead and deal with something if there are conflicting um, decisions going on at the Court of Appeals. But, um, but sometimes we don't catch that. Uh, you know, you've got all these cases and you've got multiple issues raised in the cases and um, it might be something that really no one has caught until it's too late and then it comes out and we have perhaps, you know, the same thing coming out at the same time. Uh, we certainly hope that we, um, if something is already out there, that we have researched it and we don't have something come out that conflicts with a prior case. But of course, we do rely on the briefs that are submitted to us, and um, some of them are very good, and some of them are not. And uh, so, of course, we try to do as much research as we can to make sure that we have covered everything. But um, you know, we do have a whole lot of cases, and if, especially if a case was not well briefed before us, uh, you know, it's possible for us to miss something. So, so we, we certainly are aware of that. We work very hard to avoid it. And, and I can tell you that there have been many instances where we have avoided it because we <laughs> have been aware of it uh, before opinions come out. And we go ahead and we resolve those issues before they get out there. But, you know, some do slip through. Judge Davis? Um, it's always embarrassing, I think, to the court when it happens. I don't think it happens quite as much, maybe, as, as some people think. But there certainly are times when, unbeknownst to a panel at one end of the court, uh, a different panel happens to be working on the same issue. And I, I've never asked my colleagues, and I may be in a vast minority here, but I personally would be in favor of an en banc procedure like we have in the Fourth Circuit. Like Judge Leonard, I, ca I came of age in the federal system clerking for a federal judge when I got out of law school. And I always thought it made sense that when you have uh, splits within a, a circuit to have an en banc procedure so there can be one definitive answer for the circuit. Uh, I don't know if that's ever likely to happen. And given our heavy caseload, my colleagues would probably shoot me. Judge Stroud's probably ready to strangle me <laughs> for even suggesting it. But I do think it would be a good thing to do. Obviously, we don't have that right now. Uh, all we can do is, is hope that the Supreme Court will resolve any of those splits so there will be one voice and uh, lawyers, judges, and the public will know what the answer is on those issues. Judge Holcomb? Well, 
clearly this is an issue, and it's an issue to those who pay close attention to what is going on with the Court of Appeals. Um, in fact, within the last year, we had a situation where the same day um, there were uh, two opinions issued that appeared to reach the opposite results on the exact same case. Um, so it seems clear to me that we need better communication among the 15 judges that are on the Court of Appeals. Um, and if I'm elected, I'm going to see that we do have better communication about cases of the same subject matter uh, that are being decided at the same time. Uh, beyond that, I would agree that it would seem appropriate that we explore, um, and I know you're going to get a chance to hear from the current uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He's going to have a commission on ways we can improve the justice system coming up uh, in uh, 2015, and one of the things that I believe they should explore is the idea of having the entire Court of Appeals uh, be in a position to meet. Now, that's not something they can decide. Uh, it would have to be something the legislature approves, but certainly it's something we should look at as to whether it would be helpful to allow the entire court to sit together to uh, resolve when it's obvious that they've issued opinions that are conflicting. Yeah. Um, well, I certainly can say as a Superior Court judge, I have been in the position of having lawyers on either side of a case um, before me proudly hand up a Court of Appeals decision that supports each side. And we have to stop and we have to figure out um, how to resolve that conflict. Um, often, that can be resolved when you pay close attention to what the facts were in the case before the Court of Appeals. Um, when lawyers pay, play fast and loose with what the rule of the case is, that's when you more often see these, these conflicts. Um, I, I, I think that given the, given the system that we have now without the option of an en banc uh, proceeding, I think certainly better communication is always good. Um, more and more research is always good. Um, for my part, and, and as a trial judge, I've written many, many decisions as a single judge. I imagine the dynamic when you have a panel of three is very different. Um, but I will say that what I bring to writing decisions is what my junior high school math teacher taught me when I wasn't a very good math student, which was don't just give me the answer. Show me your work. Explain how you got that answer. If judges can take the time and do the research to explain why the court is making the decision it's making, everybody, the lawyers, the parties, other courts, and the general public can at least understand how the court reached that decision. And when the court explains its decision in terms that everyone can understand, we can understand perhaps that what might seem to be a conflicting decision actually is just based on a different analysis from a different set of facts. And so that also comes down to communication and how well these decisions are written. <clears throat> Judge Davis, as of yesterday, uh as I read the statute, the legislature has curtailed the jurisdiction of the Court of Appeals by now, now sending appeals from the business courts straight to the Supreme Court. Do you think that's a wise decision, and what impact is it likely to have on the development of appellate law in North Carolina? Well, it's certainly a policy decision for the legislature to make. So you know, I don't think judges really ought to be expressing whether they like it or don't like it, or whether it's good government or not good government. I mean, just from a personal perspective, having a strong civil background, I always greatly enjoyed working on the business court appeals. So from that perspective, I will miss uh, working on them. But uh, the legislature made its decision. We need to respect it. We have wonderful justices on our Supreme Court, and uh, I'm sure they will uh, enjoy the, the complexities of the cases and will issue great rulings. Judge Holcomb? Could you repeat the question? Uh, as of yesterday, uh, the legislature has restricted the jurisdiction uh, of the Court of Appeals uh, by sending appeals now from the business courts directly to the Supreme Court rather than to the Court of Appeals. Uh, is this a good decision or, more importantly, what impact do you think this will have on the development of appellate case law in North Carolina? Well, based upon our answers to the last question, 
um, it would appear that you could expect that there would be more consistent law since it's not coming through the Court of Appeals and then going to the Supreme Court. It's coming directly from the Supreme Court. And of course, all of us have to follow that. Um, so in that sense, it may well um, clarify some of those things. Clearly, those of you who paid attention to what the legislature um, did in this regard um, would know that, they're, that the current legislature is very concerned about the development of the business court. They didn't simply change the jurisdiction. They also specified that um, two of the seats that are gonna come back up, including specifically uh, Judge Inman's seat, uh, would be a business court seat. So they're expanding the business court. Um, I think they're very interested in seeing that court uh, have uh, more opportunity to take business cases and to have clear and consistent law. And certainly in the business arena, the more consistent the decisions are, um, the better it is for a business environment. So um, I, I think it will certainly cause um, some clarity, um, although you may get obviously fewer decisions depending on how the Supreme Court chooses to address those particular cases, whether they um, take more of those, whether they um, try to deal with them in a, in a, in a, uh, in a quickened fashion. Um, and again, as Judge Inman has proposed, uh, to the extent that they uh, take those cases and, and um, explain their rulings, uh, then certainly there's an opportunity by streamlining it to uh, clarify that law. Judge Inman? Well, let's see. I don't know what I can add. I, I would share with Judge Davis um, just uh, uh, having practiced commercial litigation for many years. Um, the disappointment of not being able to um, work on business court cases, but this isn't about me and what I like to do. It's about what's in the interest of, of the state. I do know that there's been a concern in the business community that appeals of business court cases take so very, very long, first to go through the Court of Appeals, then to go to the Supreme Court, and only to get to the Supreme Court either through a dissent at the Court of Appeals or on discretionary review. Business court judges, unlike other superior court judges, are required to write a detailed decision in every ruling they make. A detailed decision. Um, and so there's really a, should be a much better record and much better reasoning as it's coming up on appeal. Um, I think that will make it, make it um, easier for the Supreme Court to review all these cases my biggest question really is not for the Court of Appeals, but for the Supreme Court and for the Chief Justice. Um, I've, I have read his plan, but I have to confess I don't know if his plan includes uh, this change. I think it creates a logistical challenge at the Supreme Court, which is going to see its caseload increase quite a bit. And we may um, have more clarity in, in appellate law. We, may have to have just by the necessity of the volume of cases and frankly if a business court decision is written extremely well and the Supreme Court affirms it it may be a per curiam affirm in in which case the business court judges decision really is the law yes I, I don't know that I have a whole lot to add it's going to be interesting to see how this works out and I do think logistically uh, and how the Supreme Court is going to deal with that is, is one of the biggest questions. Um, you know, there's certainly some advantages uh, to this, as Judge Holcomb pointed out. Um, and, and I'm sure that you will hear more uh, from uh, Chief Justice Martin about the Supreme Court. And, and one of the challenges that it would seem to me that the Supreme Court has is, and people may not realize this outside the system, that the Supreme Court does not have the staff that the Court of Appeals has. I mentioned how cases come through our staff counsel's office. We have a whole office with, I think, what, about eight or nine attorneys and, and some other support staff uh, to help deal with cases as they come in and help get things. And the Supreme Court doesn't have that. And uh, so there are some, some issues as far as simply the administration of the court and the, the support given to our court system and the Supreme Court uh, as to how they're going to get all that done. And, and I'm sure Chief Justice Martin has it all figured out. And uh, he'll tell you about that in a little bit. <laughs> yes, so. he does. No pressure. <laughs> All right, one final question, uh, and then we'll begin to switch gears. Uh, 
Judge Holcomb, now that the U.S. Supreme Court has eliminated most restrictions on the issues that can be addressed in judicial races, what do you think are the substantive issues that the voters should focus on in determining races such as yours? So essentially he's asking what can we talk about? Um, and, but and you can talk about anything that's not <laughs> scandalous or libelous. But. <laughs> well, um, as you know, uh, those of us who are judges, we're, we're bound by ethical rules not to um, talk about issues that may come before us. And so that, um, that, that uh, keeps us from talking about a lot of things that people want to talk about on the campaign trail because if they want to talk about it, it's typically because it's a hot topic and something that the court's going to see. Um, in addition to that, I think it's important that we um, show um, adequate uh, respect for other judges and judges that, and for our institution. Um, everyone in this room is aware of the polarization that's going on in our society, the way that we look at the legislature, um, depending on which uh, viewpoint you have and who's in charge, the way that we often look at the president as the executive, as the embodiment of the executive branch, uh, very much depends on your worldview. Um, and as a result of that, more and more people are turning to the courts. Um, in fact, anything of, of, of substance that is passed by the legislature or by the governor together um, is challenged by one side or the other. And that's the reality of what we're living in. So I think it's imperative that the uh, institution of the court and those of us who are part of that and those of you, uh, all of you in this room who are gonna be part of that when you get out of law school um, and, and you're even in it now as individuals who are in that stream, um, that you help to encourage uh, people in their view of the court system because we are the last branch um, that people are putting their faith in and that's, that's uh, critical that, um, that people see it that way. So um, I think that people need to focus on uh, the qualifications that people bring to the race. What have they done? What has prepared them to do the work? Um, and then their track record of being fair and impartial. Um, in my case, I've been a judge now for six years. I handle thousands of cases every day. Um, any one of you can walk into a courtroom um, in Harnett County or Johnston County or Sanford and see me um, in my role as a judge and see whether I am doing exactly what I'm telling you I'm going to do, that I'm going to be fair, that I'm going to be impartial, that I'm going to follow the law consistently um, and treat people the way that I would want to be treated, whether as an attorney or as a litigator. To Jimmy? If I could ask you to, to repeat at least the gist of the question because I want to make sure that I understood it. Uh, now that the Supreme Court has eliminated most restrictions on the issues that can be addressed in judicial races, what do you think are the substantive issues that should be fairly considered by the voters in making a decision? Okay. Thank you. And, and the, the Supreme Court has eliminated so many limitations. There are more things that judges can uh, uh, talk about constitutionally that I don't think they should talk about. Um, even if a case is not before the court right now or not on the docket right now, I'm not going to discuss my views about that legal issue. And that is because regardless of whatever the, the limits are of what the Judicial Standards Commission would say, it's really important that the public be confident. And if a case comes before a judge who has gone on record saying, these are all my views about that substantive issue, then the public is not going to have confidence in that judge to be fair and impartial. Um, I think that experience, experience, experience is very important. Not just years of experience, but the quality of the judge's experience. Um, certainly, you can, um, you can come and find me in a courtroom, but you can also read many decisions that I've written that are in the public record and see how I right, which is very important for an appellate judge. Um, you can see any judge's written decisions and see how that person is able to articulate and reason. Um, but you know, law students might do that. The general public ain't going to do that. They're not going to be interested in that. 
the general public want to know, is this somebody I can trust? Basically, is this somebody I can trust? And that leads to endorsements from former judges. And like Judge Davis, um, I've been endorsed by scores of uh, appellate, retired appellate judges, Republican and Democrat. What I think people have a right to know, but I don't think they should base their decision on, are a judge's political affiliation. That is because, in my view, politics has absolutely no place in the courtroom. I don't advertise my party affiliation. It's not because I'm embarrassed by it. It's because not everyone who comes in my courtroom shares it. I don't advertise my faith for the same reason. And I respectfully submit that candidates who advertise themselves as Democrat or Republican are telling folks in the other party, you know, I'm on this team. I'm not on your team. Um, the elective system, one thing we didn't mention that makes it very different for judges than for other offices, it's nonpartisan. Again, nobody's hiding their party affiliation. You can look it up. But please, please don't stop with the party label. None of the judges I know, none of them, Democrats, Republicans, and an increasingly numbered judges are independent, um, want to follow any party's agenda. But when a judge is advertising for election by a party label, that is sending a message to people in that party, please contribute to my campaign. When a judge is campaigning by an ideology, the judge is sending a message, I will get this ideology accomplished for you. Um, so please look at experience, look at, look at personal information about candidates. People want to know where we grew up and what our personal lives are like. Um, look at who is supporting that person and see if someone you know supports that person. Thank you. Judge Stroud? Yes, well certainly, as Judge Inman said, all those things are important. Uh, experience, a person's background, integrity. Um, and uh, certainly for people who've been judges, you've had the opportunity to, to see that. Um, but, I, you know, the United States Supreme Court has been interesting to me, just kind of looking at all of their rulings and how they affect judicial elections. Of course, uh, a number of different opinions that have come down from the United States Supreme Court dealing with campaign finance and dealing with how uh, judicial candidates can speak out um, have uh, sort of created uh, quite a mess uh, for judicial elections. Um, and North Carolina has, has been very blessed to not ha really have any unpleasant, um, nasty judicial elections. Uh, and it looks like, well, it's already started this year uh, in the primary, uh, but it looks like this year is going to be the year that North Carolina joins the ranks of the states who do have uh, some unpleasant things uh, in advertisements and things that are that are put out there by you know primarily third party you know independent expenditure groups, um, and you know and of course you know they the people who make these ads have the right to do that you know we have our First Amendment rights it's political speech. Um, but it's a very difficult fit um, with judicial elections because we do have the obligation uh, to be impartial, not to show favoritism. I think it's very interesting in the Citizens United case, uh, Justice Kennedy talks about the fact that contributions are in fact intended uh, to, to gain favor, to gain access. Um, of course, he's talking about with legislators. Um, and that's why people make contributions to campaigns, gaining favor, gaining access. Well, so you might think, well, now we have an oath of office that we take not to show favoritism. Uh, we're not to grant special access to anyone. Uh, it's a little bit different for judges. Legislators, that is in fact what they're hired to do, to advocate a particular cause. And so Justice Kennedy in the very next paragraph says, oh, well, the Caperton case, which is dealing with judicial recusal, you know, doesn't say anything different. It's just the judges have to recuse in that situation, and, and there's still that right of free speech. But there's a tension there that's been created by the, the Supreme Court cases uh, that is, is getting increasingly uncomfortable for those of us who have to, to, to do this electoral process. 
And, um, and of course, the Supreme Court justices, uh, United States Supreme Court justices, is no secret. None of them think that judges should be elected at all. Uh, so they don't have a whole lot of sympathy for those of us in that situation. But it's, um, you know, something to just be aware of. And uh, certainly you as, a, you know, law students and lawyers can, I uh, hope, help inform people about the, the difficult situation that we've kind of been placed into now. Judge Davis. Well, as we all know, the U.S. Supreme Court has taken away a lot of the restrictions that used to exist on what judges can say on the campaign trail. But I want to go back to a very good point that Judge Inman made. Just because you can say something doesn't mean you should. And I think you ought to be really careful about supporting any judge who starts talking about their personal policy views. Um, it's obviously crucial to judges be fair and impartial. But what's also crucial, and sometimes people forget this, is how important it is that the public perceive us as fair and impartial. And I don't know how, how any member of the public can rationally believe a judge or a judicial candidate to be fair and impartial if they hear that person talking about their own personal beliefs on issues that are constitutionally entrusted to the two political branches of government rather than the judiciary. In terms of what I think people should be focusing on in these races, I think experience. Experience in the appellate courts, dealing with the appellate issues that we get. And I think the other thing to look at, as Judge Inman also mentioned, are supporters. Who is supporting the candidates? Are the groups that you believe are fair? Is it people that you look up to? I think those are the things that are most important. We've arrived at the transition hour. Uh, join me in uh, thanking our panelists today. It is, it's an honor for our law school to have you here, and uh, it's reassuring to have candidates of your caliber uh, competing for these most important positions. We are going to take a five-minute break and retool, uh, and we're going to continue talking with half of the candidates uh, who are competing for seats on our Supreme Court. Thank you.